Ladies and gentlemen, this is your reaction. This is the world at war. The Ottoman Empire enters the stage. The Great War, Week 15. Obviously, this is by the channel The Great War. Uh, in last uh, last video, yesterday, basically, we saw the Red Baron, uh, the individual video, uh, which is uh, different from the main series that you know I indeed did. I love that, right? Focus onto the you know a really key important figures of the war, right? So he probably is going to do that uh, as the you know I guess. Uh, Thing progresses along the way which i'm going to react to as well because i love things like that uh, how in world war ii there was this thing as white death a sniper uh, so yeah so this is obviously a uh, main series back to normal week 15 right it's been i guess uh four months now week 15 so uh, sh shit has been escalating and ottoman empire is going to join this time here Three months after the outbreak of the war, another world power enters the conflict, the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman war minister Enver Pasha, a supporter of a new Turkish self-confidence, wants to gain advantages for a future Turkey by declaring war. Meanwhile, another ship of the German East Asian squadron is surprising the Royal Navy by sinking two of their ships near Colonel Chile. Oh, war went to Chile. That is something, so, you know, but this is like, what, four months in, and war is already going all over the place, right, in Africa, in uh, South America, and it's going to stay for next four years. Regardless, the battles on the Eastern Front, Western Front, and in Serbia are continuing. Yeah, you know, I always thought of this World War One as, you know, four-year-long war, sure, but I thought, you know, World War began, I guess, midway or something, after two years or something. I didn't know it just became World War pretty immediately. War started in Africa, in Americas, Japan and everything in just what, four months in? So this is truly World, World War One, I, I guess. So yeah, let's watch it. Remember, Bill, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe so I know which type of videos to react to more, which type of channels to react to more. 75% of you who watches my video regularly are not subscribed, so just click the subscribe button, you know. Uh, so also, you know, you'll know which new videos from different channels I upload because I try to keep a schedule but sometimes I upload three videos, sometimes I upload eight to ten videos a day. That is no accurate thing. So, you know, yeah, it, it's easier to, I guess, you know, know when I upload a video. So, subscribe and you'll be supporting my channel. And check out what the week Sunday, there's a link in the description. Check out the cast for the different playlists because there's so many videos on my channel. I don't even know how many. You know, it's easier to navigate that way. And check out the end cards. And yeah, that's what you Three months of war have devastated Europe, and with conflict recently spreading to colonial territory in Africa and the Far East, it grew ever larger. It would grow many times larger this week, though, and open up huge new theaters of battle as the Ottoman Empire entered the war. Biggest mistake Ottomans will make, I guess. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week, we saw the Belgians flood the fields of northern Flanders to stop the Germans. Further south on the Ypres salient, the battle raged on and on with the Germans readying a new offensive while the French began to move up to help the British. In the east, the Russians were driving back the Germans in the north and the Austrians in the south, while the Russian ports on the Black Sea had just been bombed, seemingly by the Ottoman Empire. On November 1st, Russia declared war on the Ottoman Empire. Now the thing about Turkey is that it was seen as backwards and pretty easy pickings for the Europeans who had found a new love for Middle Eastern oil. This was an error. Enver Pasha, the Turkish Minister of War, now practiced a French revolutionary model of nationalism, a new language, a new interpretation of history, and a wholly national future. He was willing to make large sacrifices and use almost any means to achieve his goals, and Pasha actually tricked his government into going to war. Last week, around this time, Europe were basically dominating the world stage in Africa, in America, Asia, everywhere, right? So obviously, they didn't see Turkey as there's no Europeans. Of course, they're back on it's Ottoman Empire. By now, Ottoman Empire has been losing their ground a lot. So of course, they didn't think much of Turkey. Like, yeah, Ottoman Empire, who cares? You know, they had nothing, they're going to be easy or something like that. Two German battleships were in Turkish waters, and Pasha got the crews to wear fezes, pretend to be Turks, and bombard the Russian ports on the Black Sea, hoping the Russians Why? would declare war on Turkey. This worked, and three empires were now fighting against Russia. But if you look at them, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, and their respective war agitators, Helmut von Moltke, Konrad von Hotzendorf, and Pasha, 
nothing worked out the way they had dreamed, and millions of their countrymen died as a direct result of their actions. Wait a minute. So let me get this straight. The war minister of Ottoman Empire, Enver Pasha, he wanted to go to war and join the world wars, but I guess his government did not. So he created this kind of a scenario where he, you know, I guess uh, took two German ships and I guess give, give them decoration to the soldiers and everything. So it looks like they are Turkish and attack Russia. So in turn, Russia would attack Turkey and just, you know, Ottomans would join the war. Is that it? Because that's traitorous, right? I mean, once the Ottoman Empire eventually realizes, like only reason Russia attacked is because Russia thought that Turkey attacked them first. Now, why did that happen? Investigation wouldn't eventually leave to Pasha. But I guess all that thing would happen later on. Immediately it's war, so they have to prepare for war. But damn, so what? Uh, when after all said and done, after everything was finished, did Enver Pasha face traitorous charges or something like that? Because that's pretty traitorous, right? Ottoman didn't want to join the war, but because of one guy they had to. And that led to their downfall and all the Middle East crisis that we have today. So all the Middle East crisis that we have right now, Ottoman Empire's fall, can be traced back to Enver Pasha. Because let's be honest, if Ottoman didn't join Germany and Austria losing side, I guess they wouldn't have broken up as the way they did. I'm not saying Ottoman Empire would have survived, but at least they wouldn't have broken up like they did immediately. So I guess all the issue can be traced back to Enver Pasha. That's fucked up. The first actions taken against the Turks happened immediately. The Russians sent troops into eastern Turkey in what would become the Bergman Offensive. And on November 3rd, the British and French bombed the Dardanelles, though neither Britain nor France would declare war on the Ottomans for another couple of days. One country with an historic grievance against the Ottoman Empire was Serbia, only independent since 1878, and she declared war on the Turks November 2nd. Now, Serbia was at the center of the beginning of the whole war back in July, though we hadn't heard much from her since she managed to drive the Austrian army from her land in September. Oh, yeah. But Austria-Hungary was about to try again. On November 6th, General Oskar Partiorek launched an offensive on three fronts with 500,000 troops against half that number of Serbs. Partiorek had failed disastrously earlier in the war, mainly through conceit and incompetence, and the confidence of his troops was low in spite of their numerical advantage, but off they went. It's really no surprise that the Austrian army was demoralized when you see what was going on on the Russian front. After breaking out of the siege at the fortress of Przemysl, the Austrians had mounted a big offensive against Russia, only to be driven back with terrible losses. In early November, they were once again pulling back from the river San to the fortress, with the Russians slowly tightening the noose. I say slowly, but that's a bit of a surprise at this point, actually. Both the Austrians and the Germans had been astonished by how well and especially how quickly the Russians had redeployed along the Vistula River the last two weeks of October to win the battles of Ivangorod and Warsaw. So Europeans were astonished how Turkey was doing. Uh, the Germans and Austrians were surprised how Russia was. Everybody was surprised at each other. So before the war started, nobody was, nobody had real intel of that enemy. Everybody was keep getting surprised. So this world war happened, and everybody was basically, you know, uh, this was becoming more modern, right? World War One. Uh, Germany had a unique advantage that 50 years ago they didn't. Uh, everybody was changing in a way, and the global scale war broke out where you know people's older knowledge of the country are now old so the newer countries like russia are suddenly mobilizing turkey not ottoman empire you know having this kind of a new kind of image not as weak as everybody thought so everybody was getting surprised by everybody and that was a surprise factor i constantly said this in world war one whether it's equipment war how the wars happened and what people thought of each other everything was you know a surprise factor it was world war one World War II was fucked up because it was fucked up at that scale. World War I was fucked up because of surprise factor, basically. The Russian follow-up plan was pretty straightforward. Continue to drive toward Berlin with their new reinforcements from Siberia and Central Asia and attack the Austrians further south between Krakow and Przemysl. One problem with this attack, though, was railways. The Russians had been great at using the railways in central and southern Poland in late October. But there were few railways in western Poland. This was a deliberate defensive maneuver, but the Germans had destroyed what few there were while retreating. 
But in the end, it was mainly because of the unpreparedness of their rear that the Russians pursued their enemies too slowly. And as a result, the German armies managed to escape destruction. And by November 8th, the Russian advance was forced to halt when the rear was 150 kilometers behind the front lines, which disrupted the supply of both food and ammunition. On the Western Front, there was nothing like 150 kilometers between anything. In fact, the distance between the two enemies was often less than 150 meters, and mm. the fighting was fierce, and it would continue all week long. German Chief of Staff Falkenhayn began a new offensive along the line in Flanders. One of his main goals was Geluvelt, and on the morning of October 31st, the British were driven out of it, and there was suddenly a real threat of a German breakthrough. But amazingly, British reinforcements managed to turn the tide in the afternoon and retake the town and secure the Menin Road. By the end of the day, it was plain that the German advance had been stopped, and the feared breakthrough to the sea halted. The yeah, so basically that, uh, you know, that line in Flanders, f French and British troops are really holding it. Why? Because they can let that go because British are fearing that they would come way too close to the, I guess, British coast if they let go of that position. So they are defending that line with, you know, everything they have. They are not letting that go. So even when they lose, by the afternoon they retakes it back. Make sure the line doesn't get pushed uh, more back west, I guess. The British spent that night digging in and fighting off German attacks, and the next day, the right flank of the British lines was taken over and strengthened by French troops. By the evening of November 3rd, much of the German high command had abandoned their hopes of a breakthrough after suffering 17,500 casualties in three days. Interestingly enough, there were many German officers on the Western Front who believed that now would be a good time to reverse the Schlieffen plan and instead focus on the Eastern Front, where a decisive victory might still be possible. Okay. But the Kaiser and Falkenhayn still believed in the Western victory. And on November 6th, the Kaiser himself came to the region to encourage his troops. While there, though, he made a blunder that left a bad impression on many of his soldiers by chatting amiably in English to British prisoners of war. Although the fighting on the East <laughs> Salient would continue to mid-November, several... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the German Kaiser, right? Trying to encourage our troops that we are better than anything, right? This is the moment where I should show my support in that way. Oh, look at that English prisoner of war. I'm going to show him how fluent I speak English. Yeah, that is bad PR. Several of the battles of the Race to the Sea were ending this week. Along the line, the fighting was winding down at La Bassie, Messine, and Armentiers. But all of these battles, all along the line, that had already claimed hundreds of thousands of casualties, were the real end of something big. They were the final battles of maneuvering along the Western Front until 1918. One arena of battle where there would be constant maneuvering throughout the war, though, was at sea. This week, the war at sea reached South America with the Battle of Coronel off the coast of Chile. Now, early on in the war, the German East Asia Squadron under Maximilian von Spee had abandoned its base at Sing Tau once the Japanese had joined the British. Spee's ships had headed east to disrupt commercial shipping. On November 1st, Spee was engaged by a British naval squadron, despite the fact that the British were hopelessly outclassed in ships, crew, firepower, and training. He sank the ships Good Hope and Monmouth, and 1,500 British sailors drowned. Spee's casualties were just three men injured. Damn. However, he used half of his supply of ammunition, and this was irreplaceable. So in spite of a major victory, Spee was in a bad way. Sing Tao itself was also in a bad way. It had been under siege by the Japanese and the British for nearly two months. But at the end of October, the Japanese had begun shelling the city. The bombardment lasted for a week before Japanese infantry could defeat the Germans. A great side note here, Gunther Pluschel, one of the most interesting characters of the whole war, as pilot of the only German plane at Sing Tau, allegedly shot down a Japanese plane with his pistol. This was the first aerial victory in aviation history. Only German plane, he shot down a Japanese plane with his pistol. This is Hollywood level shit. I'm trying to imagine the whole scenario. He just pulled out his pistol from his plane and shot down the enemy plane. Damn. Pluschau then left the colony on the 6th, carrying documents and dispatches, but crash landed in China. Okay? He escaped from China to the west, but was arrested by the British in Gibraltar and sent to a POW camp in Britain. After that, 
he became the only man in either world war to escape from Britain and make it back to Germany. True story. In Africa, this week saw the battles of Tanga and Kilimanjaro, which together were an offensive by British and Indian troops to take German East Africa. Both battles failed spectacularly, especially the larger one at Tanga, where the Germans were outnumbered as much as eight to one, but still won thanks to British incompetence and lack of training. Damn. And the brilliance of German General von Lettau Vorbeck, who would lead the German troops in East Africa until the end of the war without ever suffering a defeat, in spite of always being outnumbered. Now, Letau Vorbeck was a master of guerrilla warfare and spent much of the war launching raids that tied down tens of thousands of British and colonial troops, preventing them from going to Europe to fight. So at the end of the week... Oh, that is some next level shit. How many areas this war and tactics spread through, right? First of all, in throughout this whole entire war, Germany has been the one, one country that have been holding entire side of the war, right? Because uh, Austria basically gets its ass kicked by Serbia, Russia constantly, right? They are incompetent compared to Germany. Germany is the only one in that side who's actually doing the real fighting. And clearly they are overpowering, right? 8 to 1 and they still kick British and Indian troops ass in Africa. So Germany is around this time is really powerful. I, I, I always say then somebody in the always comments go like, oh yeah, this and that. But look at that, evidence says so. And it, Germany is holding that entire side against the enemy of multiple countries. And one of the tactics is also that in Africa, make sure the British and Indian troops stay engaged there so they don't come to Europe and fight in that front. Because let's be honest. Germany is fighting alone in lots of side most of the time and they, they can only have enough troops. Russia is already overpowering with the troops. You can't have British and Indian troops, you know, walking in France and just attacking through Western Front or something. So their tactics were also there, like make sure that they, those troops stay occupied in Africa. And throughout the entire four year period, that guy never lost a war. So wouldn't it be more smart to put him in somewhere around Germany in actually European frontier? Then just make him sure that he stays in Africa. I guess, you know, it was more important so reinforcement don't come to Europe. And actually winning wars around Germany at the time. I guess that just made sense that he's so good around the area where he at, right? He's great at guerrilla warfare in Africa. So let's keep him there because he's making sure more troops are not coming. Because that was really vital. The Germans are stalled in the West and the Russians in the East. The Austrians are running from the Russians but moving against the Serbs. And with the Ottoman entry into the war and battles in Africa and the Far East, the conflict becomes ever more global. Enver Pasha got what he wanted. The Ottomans were now at war. For Pasha, the aim of the war was clear. A new Turkish nation would be born from the struggle and bonded by the suffering. A nation that did not look to the Arab world for guidance, but looked to itself. But while this goal was ultimately successful, Turkey would lose a quarter of her entire population in the struggle. Millions of men, women, and children, many of them starving or freezing to death. And Enver Pasha would never be the man to lead those who lived. And a little coda here, the Western Front had been a stalemate for nearly two months, but before that, it was very much a war of motion. Yeah, so anytime somebody comes along and says, we should, this nationalistic view of, we should forge our own nation by the suffering and blood of the people if necessary to, you know, become this and that. Anytime somebody says that, I always hate that shit. What a piece of shit, right? Because... He never cares about anybody else. He's fine with putting, you know, deaths and suffering of his fellow people because it's not him. He's not the one who's suffering, right? He's not the one who's doing things. He's fine with everybody else suffering. Fuck it, who cares? I always hate people like that. New, new Turkey will rise up. New Ottoman Empire will rise up through pain and suffering of others. Why do I give a shit? That's his mentality. <sighs> This uh, now Ottoman has joined in. So uh, up until now, it was basically Germany and Austria, right? Austria not being as competent as Germany, but now Ottoman is entering. We'll see how Ottoman do uh, throughout the war. Uh, we know they are going to lose every Germany, Austria, Ottomans, but I want to see how Ottomans do week by week basis, how uh, how good they are in battlefield, I guess. All right, people, that was the World War. The Ottoman Empire enters the stage, the Great War, week 15. If you like my reaction, 
don't forget to like and subscribe so i know we start videos to react to more i guess uh you know check out the other sunday there's a link in the description check out the castle plays like history indian historian cgp gray because they're not all different categories of channels and things i've done it's on all the playlist and yeah i'll see you next time